the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. And so once again we find ourselves in Dr. Watson's cheerful firelit study. Outside, a cutting October wind scurries the brittle leaves. But inside, all snug and cozy with his feet on the well-polished fender, sits our favorite host and storyteller. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Thank you. And which of Holmes' fabulous adventures are we to have tonight, sir? But tonight it's the case of the missing heiress. A Canadian heiress, to be exact. Pert and pretty as a picture. And with a mind of her own. I can never forget her father's expression when he discovered the compromising situation she... Oh, there I go, getting ahead of myself as usual. Well, now, don't look so worried, Mr. Harris. I hadn't forgotten. This is where we say a few words on behalf of a very generous sponsor. Thank you, Dr. Watson. And our sponsor really is generous in more ways than one. Take the amazing values he gives, for instance. Clipper Craft Clothes are just about as fine as can be made and so modestly priced. I dare say even a Sherlock Holmes would be stumped at how it's done, but it's elementary, Dr. Watson. It's the famous Clipper Craft Plan, where in 924 leading stores from coast to coast concentrate their buying power, assuring you of great savings in manufacturing and distribution costs. As a result, you get the benefit of group buying, plus the friendly personal attention you expect at your own local independent store. Clipper Craft's extraordinary value is obvious once you've worn them, For where else, indeed, can you find expensive-looking suits like Clippercrafts at only $30 to $40? There are a few deluxe models, too, at $43.75. Topcoats and overcoats are only $30 to $40, and sport jackets are only $24. Yes, solving your clothes problem is easy this fall. Just take this clue. Compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Mr. Harris, to our story. The case of the missing heiress. Put your boots on the fender and make yourself comfortable. Mm, A perfect combination. A crackling fire to warm one's feet and a hair-raising adventure to chill one's spine. (laughs) Sounds rather like like one of those confounded hot and cold shower baths that are the curse of this modern age. Now, in the good old Baker Street days, when one made one's daily ablutions in a tin tub that was filled from a pair of steaming jugs... One got in and out as fast as possible to prevent freezing to death, eh, Dr. Watson? Only in the wintertime, Mr. Harris, only in the winter. I remember one bright July afternoon in the year... Let me see. Well, never mind, it was before you were out of your cradle... I was splashing about in my morning tub. I I thought you said it was afternoon. (laughs) When one shared lodgings and adventures with the great Sherlock Holmes, one frequently took one's morning tub in the afternoon or evening. Now, uh, where was I? Uh, Splashing around in your morning tub in mid-afternoon. Oh, yes, yes, yes. As a matter of accuracy, I was just removing the soap from back of the ears and giving a not inspired rendition of a current comic opera hit when Holmes burst in rather unceremoniously. Wandering minstrel, I a thing of shreds and patches. I have... Heaven's sake, Watson, stop that caterwauling and throw on a dressing gown. We're about to have a caller, and I'm sure it means another case. And why should that interrupt my bath? You're quite capable of handling the first stages of a case by yourself, Holmes. Not when it concerns a lady in hysterics in a court train. You're much better than I at managing female agitation. Holmes, what are you raving about? An elegant carriage has just galloped up to our curbstone. And without waiting for the footman to alight from the box and assist her, a middle-aged creature in full court regalia, complete to the feathers in her hair, bursts out into the street and is even now pulling our front doorbell out by the roots. Oh, Lord, well... uh... Aha, Mrs. Hudson's let her in. She's coming up the stairs. Now, will you come out and protect me? Certainly not. Very well, then. I shall be obliged to usher her in here. Oh, no, 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 great Scott. Wait, I'm coming, I'm coming. Good Lord, look at me. Fine way to greet a lady. (laughs) Don't worry. Unless I'm greatly mistaken, she's too upset to notice. Here, tie yes. the cord around your middle. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, and you put your slippers on the wrong feet. Oh, confound it. I will... Come in. Oh, Mr. Holmes. Oh, Mr. Holmes, thank heavens I find you at home. Why, Lady Maynard. Oh, Dr. Watson, delighted to see you. Could you give me a glass of sherry? Oh, this is terrible. I'm ruined. And the poor girl, she, 
Oh, Mr. Holmes, you must find her. You must. Of course, Lady Maynooth. But first, perhaps you'd better tell us the name of this damsel in distress and inform us just what difficulty she seems to be in. Oh, that's just it. I haven't the remotest idea. Oh, I don't mean I don't know her name. It's Elizabeth. Elizabeth Bascom. Not Miss Lizzie Bascom, the only child of old Hellfire Bascom, the Canadian Copper King. That's right, Dr. Watson. Oh, quite the belle of the season, I gather. Yes, Elizabeth has certainly been popular. Not that it's made the slightest impression on her. Mm, yes, perhaps that explains her popularity. That and her father's millions. Uh, but why are you so concerned about Miss Elizabeth Bascom, Lady Maynard? It's been my responsibility to sponsor the young lady through her first London season, to see that she makes the proper social connections, and, well, her father is bound and determined that she shall marry into the nobility. I had no idea that George Bascom more often referred to as Hellfire, was one of your acquaintances, Lady Maynard. To be quite frank, Mr. Holmes, I've never set eyes on Elizabeth's father, but a, well, a mutual friend, knowing that he was anxious to have her received in the best circles, and also knowing that my own uh, financial position has not been too secure lately, well, I was, shall we say, persuaded to take Elizabeth under my wing. I hope you made a profitable arrangement. I did, Mr. Holmes. But I've earned it, every penny. You, uh, you mean the young lady is uncouth in spite of her good looks? Oh, no, Dr. Watson. The truth forces me to admit that Elizabeth is really quite presentable and even lovable when not crossed. But when she is crossed, she takes after her father? Exactly. She insists on going for solitary walks, completely unchaperoned. She strikes up an acquaintance with the most unlikely people. Democratic, eh, Holmes? It might be considered democratic in an ordinary female. But where a young woman of Miss Bascom's wealth is concerned, it's rather dangerous. Oh, how true. We've been receiving, well, not exactly threats, but certainly crank letters ever since it became known that Elizabeth had come to stay with me. But she absolutely refuses to pay heed to her own danger. Says she's been handling situations of that sort all her life, and she refuses to become perturbed about it at this late date. And now it's happened. What has? Oh, well, well, I, I finally persuaded her to take an interest in young Lord Weaverbrook. A very suitable match in every way. In fact, her father is arriving on the next boat in order to announce the engagement. Well, surely that's nothing to be upset about. Oh, yes, but what is he going to do when he finds his daughter has been abducted? Abducted? You mean forcibly? This note was pinned to the carriage seat when I returned and found Elizabeth gone. I gather from your costume, Lady Maynooth, that you were on your way to Buckingham Palace? Yes, Mr. Holmes. After considerable maneuvering, I had arranged to have Miss Bascom received at court... It took a bit of doing, and I'll admit I expected trouble with Elizabeth. However, she fell in with the plan with quite a show of alacrity, even standing patiently for endless things of her train and taking lessons in how to make a court bow. Yes, and... I've often wondered how one managed it. Don't interrupt, Watson. Uh, go on, Lady Maynooth. Today, I take it, was the day. Yes, and more perfect weather one couldn't have wished for. And I must say, Elizabeth seemed to be in high spirits. We were well prepared with the usual hamper of wine and sandwiches and cake. You know that interminable wait in St. James's Park? Yes, and I, I've thought often that the sight of the ladies in their full regalia on the way to a court function is one of the great sights of London. Elizabeth seemed to share your opinion, Dr. Watson. At any rate, she seemed in unusually high spirits as the other carriages crowded around us. Lady Maynooth, it's even more exciting than a regatta. All the street musicians and the crowds passing on the sidewalks as if it were a parade. All waving and cheering and calling to us. Oh, there she goes. That's Lizzie Bassett. Get up, my dear. One doesn't wave at them. It's not done. I'm sorry. Oh, now, cover your flowers with a napkin, my dear. The sun is really becoming rather oppressive. Well, if you ask me, it's darned hot. <laughs> now, Elizabeth, you mustn't smile back. It only encourages them. But why shouldn't I smile? I'm so happy. Just console yourself another moment, dear, and we'll be inside the gate where the crowd can't follow us. Oh, then we're nearly there. Heavens, no. It takes ages, even after you're in the courtyard. Yes. Here we go. <sighs> That's better. Now, uh, let's see what's in our luncheon hamper. I'll admit I'm half starved. Oh, no. Uh, no, let's wait. Uh, I'm still so excited. Oh, Lady Maynooth, look. Who's that handsome man walking among the carriages and sticking his head into some of them? Oh, 
dear, I wish he wouldn't. His mother would be so put out if she knew he were out here. But they will do it, all the boys. <laughs> they say it's much more fun than it is inside. They may know things coming this way. Oh, he's going to stop. Well, so this is the carriage that has been causing all the commotion. No wonder. Hello there. Hello yourself. Well, that's refreshing. So this is the beautiful Lizzie who has set the town on its ears. Oh, Lady Maynooth, I, I didn't notice you at first. You wouldn't by any chance have some smelling salts? The Dowager Duchess of Kiel seemed rather wonky as I passed a barouche. I, I wonder if you'd come and take a look at it. Why, of course, certainly. Let's see, where did I put the smelling salts? Uh, in your reticule, Lady Maynooth. Oh, yes, yes, of course. I'll be right back. Oh, and Elizabeth. Yes, Lady Maynooth? If that gentleman should return, be sure you address him as Your Highness. And that, Mr. Holmes, was the last I saw of Elizabeth Bascom. She was abducted, abducted in broad daylight, right there in the courtyard of Buckingham Palace. You, uh, you don't think it was done by a prince of the blood royal? Oh, they've been known to pull some rather spectacular pranks. No member of the House of Hanover, Dr. Watson, would write this note. It was pinned to the cushions of the seat, directly behind the box. Uh, may I see Lady Menu? Of course, Mr. Holmes. Yes, the whole affair was undoubtedly planned in advance. Well, what makes you say that, Holmes? The words are printed in ink, large, bold lettering, and the paper's been folded. Furthermore, there's a rather carefully executed dusky palm print in the lower left-hand corner. But what is the message? What does the note say? The words of communication of this sort are always the least enlightening part of the epistle, Watson. But just to satisfy your curiosity, I'll read them to you. Dashed right of you. We have kidnapped Lizzie. If you know what's good for her, don't tell the cops. Signed... The Black Hand. Oh, a band of American cutthroats. The words kidnapped and cops are dead giveaway. I've heard of these Black Hand gangs. Poor Lizzie. Uh, men like that are desperate characters. Oh, dear. We can only hope her father will arrive in time to pay any r ransom demand. <gasps> oh, Mr. Holmes. Yes, we uh, may be dealing with a band of cutthroats and desperados, but let's not jump to any conclusions, Watson, until we've examined the scene of the crime. What do you mean you expect to find clues in all that turmoil in the courtyard of Buckingham Palace? No, Watson. The scene of the crime is much closer than that. It is, in fact, drawn up to our curb. I allude, of course, to Lady Maynooth's carriage. Oh, I see what you mean. I hadn't thought of that. Well, come along. What are we waiting for? For you to go and finish dressing, Watson. Whoa, Jonathan. Easy now, Penelope. Handsome horses you have, Lady Menouf. Thank you. Uh, this is Horace, Mr. Holmes. Horace has been our footman for over 50 years. I am man and boy. And that's the truth. A record to be proud of, Horace, in these troubled times. Eh? He's a little deaf, Mr. Holmes. It's his age. I said you've a fine record, Horace. Eh, I have that. Uh, if you'll open the door, please, Horace. Uh, Mr. Holmes is a detective. He'd like to inspect the carriage. I know who Mr. Holmes is, Mum. Everybody knows Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Uh, Horace, when did you first become aware that Miss Bascom was not in the carriage? What? Uh, w when her ladyship come back and found your note. You didn't see or hear anything unusual before that? I did not. Henry, he's our coachman, you know, had gone off to help Lord Brunsey's man, uh, who was having trouble with his horses. And I had me hands full holding our horses, uh, uh, but I handled them. Start fellow, Horace. I mean, Horace. Uh, besides uh, which, I'm a bit deaf. Uh, not that you could notice, uh, but it keeps me from hearing things. Mm, I'm afraid Horace is but a broken reed in this affair. What's that? I said thank you, Horace. <clears throat> Well, let's um, have a look inside the carriage. Uh, give me my magnifying glass, Watson. Oh, yes. Hmm. Yes, it's interesting. Very interesting. What have you found, Holmes? Bloodstains? On the contrary, there's not the slightest indication of a struggle. Either Miss Bascom left the carriage of her own free will, or she was lured out of it by someone she considered a friend. Very significant. Very. Well, significant, Holmes, but uh, hardly helpful. Yes, here is her parasol, neatly furled. Surely, if she'd been attacked, she'd have attempted to use it as a weapon. 
And the luncheon hamper, neatly placed in the corner. Open up the lid, Watson. Uh, very well. Hello. What's up? The silly thing's empty. Not even a crumb left. Why, the blackguards. They not only abducted my ward, they stole my lunch as well. What if the pound cake hadn't even been cut into? The scoundrels. Well, Holmes, I'm afraid we've really drawn a blank. No clues, no clues at all. Uh, not so fast, Watson. Here is a long thread of heavy silk. Uh, Lady Maynooth, has Miss Lizzie by any chance a garment with a blue fringe in her wardrobe? Yes, of course. Uh, the pelerine that goes over a puce walking suit. But what has that to do with the case? She was wearing full court regalia when she was abducted. That's what makes it so preposterous, really. You know, you couldn't possibly kidnap a lady in a court costume. Hello, here's something in the side pocket of the hamper. Why, that's Elizabeth's guidebook. She was always sneaking off by herself with that under her arm. From the number of times it happened, she must have visited all the sites of London. Not all, Lady Menuth. I fancy Miss Elizabeth rather specialized in the British Museum. Well, how do you arrive at that conclusion? The rest of the volume is rather stiff, showing very few of the pages have been read. But notice how readily the book opens at the portion describing the British Museum. And here, the paragraphs describing the famous Elgin Marbles. That page is decidedly dog-eared. The Elgin Marbles? Yes. Good heavens, I had no idea Elizabeth was a connoisseur of art. I fancy Miss Elizabeth is a connoisseur of many things of which you had no idea, Lady Benou. Oh, dear, what do we do now? I suppose we'd better consult Scotland Yard. I rather fancy that a certain Mr. Percy Smithers will prove more helpful in this matter. I suggest that Watson and I pay him a visit. Percy Smithers? Who in thunder is he? The famous archaeologist and authority on Greek and Roman relics. He is also curator of the Elgin Marbles. Here we are, Watson. The British Museum. Imposing if somewhat moth-eaten old mausoleum, eh, Juan? Well, you needn't point it out to me as if I'd never laid eyes on it before. I had an uncle whose idea of entertaining his various visiting nephews was to trail them through the British Museum. And you, of course, have never been guilty of escorting your juvenile relatives through its echoing halls. Well, that is, one must keep up the traditions, you know. Well, never mind. Open the door. I can't. It, it's stuck. Oh, never mind. Here comes an attendant. I say, God, the entrance seems to be a bit balky. We can't get it open, don't you know? And why would you? Been locked up for the night. Closing time was 20 minutes ago. Oh, then I guess we won't get to see the marbles today, Holmes. I'm not particularly interested in the marbles, Watson. The guard, can you tell me if Mr. Smithers, curator Percy Smithers, is still on the premises? Oh, no, sir. He's gone home. You saw him leave? Well, he always leaves five minutes before closing time. I don't suppose you can give us his home address. Oh, I can do better than that, sir. There it be, over there. First house across the quadrangle. The one with the bay window? That's right. Thank you. Come along, Watson. Do you know this fellow Smithers, Holmes? Only slightly, Watson. I've met him at the Diogenes Club from time to time when I've gone there to see my brother Mycroft. Like all the rest of the members, he's what you might call taciturn. Oh, the grumpy old professor type, I take it. Professorial and grumpy, I grant you, but he's certainly not old. In fact, Mr. Percy Smithers looks not unlike the Greek statues he's such an authority on. Only with more clothing, of course. Oh, yes, yes. I can remember that there were many elderly ladies who got up a petition demanding draperies be put on the marbles when they first went on exhibition. <laughs> I, of course, consider them perfect as they are. Then you've seen the Elgin marbles? Well, many times. You recall the statue of Perseus? Perfectly. Could you describe his attitude? I can do better than that. I can duplicate it. He's, uh, he's standing like this. Not bad, except the positions of the left and right arm should be reversed. Oh. Has your friend took a fit, sir? Certainly not. I, I, I was just... Uh, I, I was just explaining something. And stop following us. I wasn't following, sir. I was just going home to me supper. Bumpkin. You recall the face, Watson, of the Persia statue, I mean? Oh, naturally. How would you describe the nose? Well, uh, that is uh, uh, Grecian, of course. Wrong again, Watson. That particular statue has no nose at all. Probably been missing for centuries. Oh. oh, but here we are at Mr. Smithers' door. Ring the bell, Watson. That's a good fellow. Always giving orders. Well, I still don't understand what information you expect to gather from a curator of the British Museum about a missing Canadian heiress. You never know, Watson. You never know. Yes, what do you want? We've come to see Mr. Smithers. Mr. Percy Smithers. Well, you can't see him. I'm sorry to disturb him if he's having his supper, but this matter is rather urgent. You can't see him because he's not come home. 
And as for his supper, it's been burnt to a crisp waiting for him. And a fine trout it was, too, that he ordered special. What a pity. Uh, perhaps you could tell me if a young lady in a blue and puce walking suit has called on Mr. Smithers lately. Certainly not. Mr. Smithers is a respectable man and a woman eater besides. Well, once again we draw a blank. This case seems to lead nowhere but down blind alleys. Oh, on the contrary, Watson. The fact that Mr. Smithers did not come home for his supper is decidedly revealing. You don't think he's been forcibly kidnapped, too, by the same outfit that abducted Miss Bascom? No, I don't think there are any indications of uh, kidnapping. At least I doubt that any force was used. Of course. How stupid I've been. Mr. Smithers and Miss Bascom have eloped. <laughs> Watson, the incurable romanticist. Well... No, Watson... A woman hater, myself accepted, of course, might conceivably change his mind. But no ardent lover would order trout, a single trout for supper, on the day on which he expected to run off with his inamorata. Well, well where does that, all that get us? Whatever detained Percival Smithers was unexpected, entirely unexpected. Come, let's go home before our supper's been burned to a crisp. Oh, Holmes, how can you think of food when you haven't rescued Miss Bascom from heaven knows only what danger? Whatever danger Miss Lizzie's in, I rather imagine she enjoys. Yes, there's nothing further we can do until tomorrow at 8.30. Why 8.30? That is the time they unbar the entrance to the British Museum. Yes, we shall be waiting at 8.22. When you note the low prices of Clippercraft clothes, you're apt to be puzzled. How do they do it, you'll say? Well, the solution's no mystery at all once you know the facts. What makes them great values is the Clipper Craft plan, concentrating the buying power of 924 leading stores across the nation. Yes, remember that you buy these famous clothes at your local, favorite local store, where you're treated as a person, not just as another number on a sales check. These days, practically everything you buy costs more, but not so with Clipper Craft. You can select your fall Clipper Craft suit at only $35 and $40, with a few special numbers at $43.75. Clippercraft top coats and overcoats, too, are only $30 to $40. Sport jackets, but $24. Selling expensive clothes at inexpensive prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. The leading stores in the metropolitan area that bring you Clipper Craft clothes are Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th Street, Manhattan, Abraham and Strauss, Brooklyn, the Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark, Newark, New Jersey, and the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue, Jamaica. These great, courteous, and friendly stores are proud to add their names to that of Clipper Craft in the label of your suit, top coat, sports jacket, and overcoat. Well, it's 8.25, Holmes. Another five minutes and we shall know if your guess is right. I never guess, Watson. I say, Holmes, isn't that Lady Maynooth's carriage coming down the street at a full gallop? Yes, Mrs. Hudson must have told her she'd find us here. Yes, here she comes like a ship under full sail. I say, who's the red-faced little man with her? I rather imagine Papa Bascom has arrived. Dead, wet the dead, blasted dead, burned up. So... Oh, you're Sherlock Holmes. Why in blazes haven't you found my daughter? I was right, Watson. It is Hellfire Bascom. How do you do, sir? Good morning, Lady Menuth. Oh, Mr. Holmes, the most horrible news. The most horrible, horrible news. They haven't found a, a body. No, but first of all, when I returned home last evening, my butler informed me that all the sandwiches, the wine and the cake, had been found in the jardinier of my best aspidistra. The, the cook is so insulted she threatens to leave. Yes, I rather suspected that hamper held something more interesting than food when I found that blue thread. And that's not all. Tell him the worst. Well, this morning, before I'd even had time to have my morning tea, Lord Brunt's man returned Elizabeth's court gown and feathers. They'd been found in his carriage. Why, the scoundrel. Oh, he wasn't in it at the time. He was still at the reception when his coachman discovered the dress. But this makes matters even worse. The poor girl was abducted in her, in her petticoats. Yes, the poor, poor girl. Her reputation will be ruined. Ah, uh, blast her reputation, ma'am. She'll catch her death a cold. Calm yourself, Mr. Bascom. 
I think I may be able to return your daughter with both her health and her reputation moderately intact. Uh, yes, they're opening the doors now. If you will follow me. In the British Museum? Calm yourself, uh, Mr. Bascom. A little culture is quite harmless, I assure you. Ah, our friend the guard. I believe you're about to unlock the hall to the Elgin Marbles. Mind if we watch? No, not if it'll give you any amusement. I've been unlocking it eight years now, and it's never what, been what you might call fascinating. Today, I think you may be in for a surprise. Well, seeing's believing. Well, it's about time. Where the devil were you last night? Didn't you hear me shouting? Mr. Smithers, you've been locked in with them marble women all night. And one that wasn't marble. Lizzie. Lizzie! What in thunder are you doing here? Mm, yes, and wearing the puce and blue walking suit. Papa! Well, what do you know? Papa, I want you to meet Mr. Percy Smithers, the famous scientist, and your future son-in-law. Scientist! Scientist! I wouldn't let you marry a scientist if he were the last man on Earth. But, Papa, we've been locked up together all night. Think of my reputation. Well, you... you, you you're scoundrels! You planned all this. You lured my innocent little girl into this trap. Lured, <laughs> my dear. Oh, oh my... Papa, don't be silly. I was the one that trapped Percy. I planned it all. I picked yesterday because all the crowds would be at Buckingham Palace and the museum would be empty. So you threw the food into the jardiniere, packed your walking suit in the food hamper, changed in Lord Brunce's carriage, and headed for the British Museum. Yes. The hard part was fascinating Percy so he wouldn't notice it was closing time. As a matter of fact, it wasn't as hard as I'd expected. You see, I suspected Percy, uh, well, liked me, but I couldn't get him to propose. But he's too confounded rich. Oh, you, you look here, my boy. You'll marry her now if I have to get out my old shotgun. Well, of, of course, I, I rather wanted to anyway, but only on one condition. What's that? Dead blast it. She has to promise to live within my income. Darling! That was all she wanted to know. And did Lizzie live within her husband's income, Dr. Watson? Well, more or less. At least if Papa gave her presents from time to time, Percy never knew about it. Uh, how did Elizabeth and her archaeologist get along? Oh, splendidly. You see, Hellfire Bascom backed several expeditions for the British Museum, and curiously enough, Percival Smithers generally headed them. He did some splendid work, too. So when he was finally knighted and Lizzie became Lady Elizabeth, everyone said she'd more than earned the title. And now, Dr. Watson, how about a hint about next week's hair raiser? Oh, next week's is a hair raiser, Mr. Harris, in more ways than one. It concerns a gentleman who had an unusually florid... I might say a crimson head of hair, and how he was hired for a decidedly curious job on that account. Oh, of course. It's the famous adventure of the Red-Headed League. How did you guess, Mr. Harris? How did you ever guess? The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran, and our stories are written by Edith Miser, with special music by Albert Berman. Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the adventure of the Red-Headed League. If you wish to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcast in New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer, and he'll tell you how to obtain tickets. Cy <laughs> Harris speaking for Clippercraft Clothes is the mutual broadcasting system. <laughs>